What's up, you guys? I'm Haley. And I'm Andrea. And this is Inhuman. I'm excited for your case. I know. I'm so excited. Um, I went down a giant like wormhole. Not even because it wasn't like I wasn't like fighting conspiracies or anything, but I didn't realize how much has happened in this case in literally the last like month. So yesterday I was like watching all the like press conferences and reading like all the court documents and stuff. So I like really went went deep into this case. So I'm excited to share it. I love that there's like new stuff happening because that's like a good sign that it's going to get solved if it's not already. Yeah. Yeah. So you'll find out um, where we're at with it, but it is a very good news. Um, So if you guys are have listened to the first 12 episodes of this podcast, we were covering one case, um, it was the Cleveland kidnappings of Michelle Knight, Amanda Berry, and Gina De Jesus. So we covered their story in the first 12 episodes. And initially, we were going to kind of do like longer seasons like that. But what we decided is we're just going to cover cases weekly. So we'll have at least two episodes a week. And we will probably some cases will be multi-parters and it'll like you know, it could be up to like four or five parts. Um, but we're going to kind of switch to more of like just that, like different cases every week. Um, and each week I will cover one case and Andrea will cover another case. So we're going to do a large variety of types of cases, big cases, small cases, unsolved, solved, all of that. Um, and we're kind of starting off this week with cases that we have both been like intrigued by, um, that have like stuck with us. So this is a case that, the one that I'm covering today, it has really stuck with me since I first heard about it, mostly because the place that it happened is somewhere I've been to and is like related to my family. Um, but that's all I'm going to say right now because oh, I don't want to wow. give it away quite yet. Although if you're okay. listening to this, other than Andrea, they probably you probably already know what the case is because I'm probably going to title the episode with the case, but Andrea <laughs> doesn't know yet. Right. Okay. So this is a disappearance and presumed murder case um, that I think is technically still, quote unquote, unsolved, but we will get into that. Um, And actually, when I first wrote that sentence, I didn't realize how much has happened. So I don't even think it's technically classified as unsolved anymore, but we'll get into that. Okay. (laughs) I want to say I first heard about the case on Crime Junkie, I believe, back in like 2019. And then because of where it took place, I was immediately intrigued and tried to find more about it. Um, And so back when I first heard about it, it was still fully unsolved. Um, But then there was movement, like I said. And that's another reason I want to cover it now. All right. So let's get into it. Kristen Denise Smart was born February 20th, 1977 in Bavaria, West Germany, to her parents, Stan and Denise Smart. Do you know this case yet? I I do know the case, uh, but I have not heard any of the okay. recent news on it. And it's not the case that I thought you were going to do, but I'm excited. Not excited. I hate that word because it's like not the right word, but I'm intrigued and right. interested that you're doing it because I like I want to know more about it. Okay, good, good. <laughs> um, okay, so she had two siblings and her parents were actually teachers in Germany teaching American children whose family was in the army. And I'm not 100% sure if her parents were actually like American or German, but I want to say they were American and just teaching in Germany because they later moved to Stockton, California. But also don't quote me on that because I'm not 100% sure that they were American. They were living in Germany. Okay. So when Kristen was like a kid, they moved to California where Kristen attended Lincoln High School and graduated in 1995. And this part of California is like more of the northern part of California. Um, It's not quite as north as San Francisco, but it's northern, I think. I'm really bad with geography, but it is northern. (laughs) Okay. 
So Kristen wanted to go to college and she enrolled at Cali California Polytechnic State University in San Luis Obispo, California, or as it's more commonly known, Cal Poly Slow. And this is why the case stuck with me because that is where my sister went to college and I have visited many times. Um, Slow is about six hours south of Stockton where Kristen's family was living. So she was moving like a decent distance from her family for college. Slow is in central California. So, you know, she wasn't like super close by, but she was a drive away. When she was in her freshman year, she would call them every Sunday night to check in and catch up with them. And her freshman year started in September of 1995. Um, and for the first few months of college, she had a normal life. So fast forward to May 24th, 1996, which was the Friday of Memorial Day weekend when we have, you know, a three-day weekend here in America. And Kristen actually decided to call her parents that night to share some good news, which couldn't find what that news was. Um, I was trying to figure it out, but it doesn't seem like it was anything like super major. Um, you know, maybe she just did well on a test or something like that. Yeah. Um, but they didn't pick up and they figured that she would call back on Sunday like she normally did. So the next day, Saturday, May 25th, Kristen was attending a party at a fraternity house off campus. Kristen was wearing black running shorts with a cropped t-shirt and red athletic shoes since it was a warm spring evening. Her and a few friends left their dorm at 8.30 p.m., but Kristen's friends didn't want to go to the party, so they dropped Kristen off a couple blocks away. And I guess it was like a friend's birthday party, but you know how college parties are. Like, there's a ton of people there, and, you know, you don't always know all the people. You, prob you probably know someone, but you definitely don't know everyone. <laughs> Exactly. And her like group of friends was not with her. They didn't want to go to the party. So she was oh, like wow. alone. She probably knew people there, but she wasn't like with her group of friends. So around 2 a.m., Tim Davis, who was a senior at Cal Poly and was one of the hosts of the party, was making sure that everyone was leaving the house when he saw Kristen laying on the lawn passed out. When he tried to wake her up, she was visibly like very impaired, clearly having had a lot to drink. And reports made by people at the party vary a ton about how much Kristen was drinking. Some saying she was like chugging vodka and some saying she wasn't drinking at all. So it's like unclear how much she actually had to drink, but she was definitely out of it when Tim found her and he woke her up and decided that she was in no condition to walk home. And let me just say, thank goodness for people like Tim. Yeah. Because I feel like some people, especially like, a senior who sees like a freshman laying on his lawn or his friend's lawn, you know, they would like just have left her or tried to get her to walk home herself or something like that. Like they don't want to get involved. Yeah, exactly. So Tim and his friend Cheryl Anderson were beginning to walk Kristen home when another student, Paul Flores, joined them. And they were all walking home together. So let's take a quick detour and talk a little bit about Paul Flores. Um, it was pretty much impossible to find many facts about him and his early life, but he was the same age as Kristen and was also a Cal Poly student studying food science. In December of the year before Kristen's disappearance, Flores was actually apprehended by the San Luis Obispo police after being sus suspected of being a peeping Tom um, or attempting to break into an off-campus apartment. Ew. Yeah. But he was never arrested and it was never like reported to the Cal Poly Police Department. So nothing really came of that. And then two months before Kristen's disappearance, another report was filed with the slow police by the same people who reported harassing phone calls that had been happening for six weeks where the caller would just call, say nothing and hang up. So they and they suspected it was Flores since he was the one that was like being a peeping Tom the previous year and trying to break in. Right. But again, he was never charged or officially recognized as a suspect. Like basically nothing came of it. Wow. So back to that evening in May 1996, Flores was also at the party and they were seen him and Kristen were seen briefly talking to each other, but not like hanging out like you would with a friend, just like they knew each other, but not friends and as they were walking home remember it's tim cheryl 
and then Paul Flores and Kristen. And as they were walking home, Flores was helping support Kristen, who could walk on her own, but was unstable. Um, Tim left the group first because he lived off campus and like left to go get his car and drive home. And then Cheryl left because her dorm was the next that they passed by. And as far as anyone knows, Cheryl was the last person besides Paul Flores to see Kristen alive. So they left her with peeping Paul. That's really great. (laughs) Right. But nobody knows that he is... Right. Has been like accused of that at all because right. he literally like it's Got never away with been it. filed. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. So according to Flores, he offered to walk her to her dorm, I think. But then he later told police that he walked her as far as his dorm, which was Santa Lucia Hall, and then let her walk the rest of the way to her dorm, which was Muir Hall. And I actually asked my sister like how far apart these dorms are. And she said they're basically part of the same door, dorm block area. So they're like three minutes apart, like basically the next building over. Um, okay. So according to him, he walked her to his dorm and then let her go the three minute walk to her dorm. But who knows? You know, we'll see. <laughs> who really knows? Yeah. Yeah. So. On May 27th, which was the Monday of that holiday weekend, another Cal Poly student, Jennifer Phipps, which I think maybe was Kristen's roommate, but I'm not 100% sure. She called the Cal Poly police to report Kristen missing, but at that time they didn't start a report. Um, Kristen wasn't actually reported missing until May 28th, which would have been the following Tuesday. And honestly, that doesn't surprise me because it's like, okay, it's the weekend. Maybe you're not seeing your roommate Monday. You're not seeing, you're kind of like, okay, weird. I'm going to report it. And then by Tuesday, she's still not there. And you're like, okay, like something, something's wrong. wrong. Right. So this was actually after that same student, Jennifer Phipps called the slow police. Um, so not the campus police, but the actual like police of the town. And she was told that it was too early to report. And they referred her back to the Cal Poly police who this time did take the report. So, you know, I feel like it's decently good that she was reported missing so early. I mean, it drives me nuts how long it takes for police departments to actually, like, I know, take it seriously. But that's not too bad that it was a couple of days. Um, You know, sometimes they, like, wait, like, a week. Yeah, exactly. So this day that the missing persons report was filed was also the same day that Kristen's parents, Denise and Stan, had heard that something was going on. So obviously they hadn't heard from her. But I don't think they actually knew that no one had seen her since Friday night until this point on Tuesday. It was known at this point that Flores was the last person to see Kristen alive. And he was interviewed by campus officers. And he told them that they separated near Santa Lucia Hall, which was his dorm. He was interviewed again at the campus police department, but this time by the Slow County DA investigators, Bill Hanley and Larry Hobson. Um, Not much came from those initial interviews, and they started doing some on-campus searches. Of course, there had been, like, reported sightings of Kristen, but none of them ever panned out. And on June 5th, campus police detective Mike Kennedy searched Kristen's dorm for evidence, and five days later, searched Flores' empty dorm room after he moved out for the year. So this is at, like, the very end of the school year. So they didn't search his dorm until he moved out. On June 19th, those same DA investigators interviewed Flores again. And according to this article in the Slow Tribune, which is pretty much what I'm going to be quoting when I quote stuff throughout this whole episode, and all of the sources will be linked in the show notes. But according to this article, quote, during the videotaped interview, Flores tells investigators that he lied when he previously stated he received a black eye playing basketball. He says he actually received the injury while working on his truck. Flores abruptly walks out of the interview before it concludes and says he won't answer any more questions. So definitely a little sketchy. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So finally, on June 26th, more than a month since Kristen was last seen, the university police chief was able to get the Slow County Sheriff's Office to take over the case. A few days later, there was a massive search of the campus bringing out around 400 volunteers to look for Kristen. They also searched a local landfill. And although they didn't find anything, four like 
search dogs separately reacted to Flores' dorm room and his mattress. And these were dogs that were specifically trained to search for human remains. So take that as you will. I personally believe that dogs are incredibly smart and those search dogs can indicate a lot, but it doesn't seem like the investigators took the dog's indication very seriously. Um, They like didn't really do anything about it. Which is unfortunate because that's what they're trained to do. Like they do very specific training for those kind of dogs, like the cadaver dogs, the drug dogs, like they hone in on that scent and that scent alone, you know? Yeah. Exactly. So like, trust your trust your dog, so, dude. <laughs> yeah, really. A few weeks later, police searched Flores' home, which I believe at this point was his parents' house where he lived with them, but they didn't find anything at that time. And finally, after that, a missing poster billboard was put up for Kristen. Not much happened in the inv- investigation after this. Prosecutors did subpoena people to testify before a grand jury, including Flores and his parents, but nothing seemed to have come of that. Six months after Kristen went missing, her parents filed a $40 million wrongful death civil lawsuit against Paul Flores, alleging that he murdered their daughter. And the Smarts attorney did interview witnesses for that civil suit, but nothing much came from that either. And to this day, the civil suit is actually still ongoing, mainly due to the fact that there is an ongoing criminal investigation. In March 1997, the Smarts attorney began a search of some rental properties owned by Flores' parents in Arroyo Grande, which is about 15 miles away from Slo. Unfortunately, though, the search didn't bring up anything tangible. In May 1997, as the one-year anniversary of Kristen's disappearance was approaching, the sheriff on the case stated that there were no other suspects besides Paul Flores, who was a person of interest at this point. Two months later, the slow sheriff finally asked for FBI assistance in the case. Um, They did go and sift through some of the dirt around Flores' dorm, but they never found anything. The FBI interviewed a ton of Cal Poly students and staff, but I don't think anything really came of it at that point. I mean, the people who had seen her had already been interviewed, and when they were going back to their dorms, it was like 2 a.m., so there weren't a ton of people out anyway. Right. And it almost feels to me that everything was sort of like half-assed in the investigation, but they, at the same time, I feel like they are doing everything that that they could other than listening to the dogs. Like they can't search him or his home anymore because they did search and nothing came up, but Mm -hmm. clearly there was some sort of wrongdoing and he was the last person to see her. So You know, they could have maybe done something, but at this point, they've interviewed him as many times as they can and haven't gotten anything substantial. So, yeah, that's unfortunate. They could have, I don't know, I feel like they should have called in like maybe a more seasoned dog, like cadaver dog that could, you know, check the mattress and stuff, you know, just like as a double check on it. Because if it hit once, like something is there, you know, even if it's not her remains like right blood. they didn't do any samples like nothing come on no exactly so on august 12th 1998 so it's now been more than two years the california governor at the time pete wilson signed a new law called the Kristen smart campus safety act of 1998 And according to the Slow Tribune, quote, the law required universities to contact law enforcement when violent crimes occur on campus. So at least something somewhat positive came came out of this. Yeah. On May 25th, 2002, the fifth anniversary of Kristen's disappearance, she was declared legally dead. And at that point, the case went cold and nothing really happened after that for almost 15 years. Wow. That's so crazy. Yeah. So now we're going to jump way forward to May of 2016, the 20th anniversary of Kristen's disappearance. Slow Sheriff Ian Parkinson, who is still the sheriff today, at this point had dedicated himself to solving the case, and he was working on it since he was elected in 2010. He was always in communication with Kristen's parents, and solving the case kind of became a personal matter to him. In 2015, he even assigned a new detective to the case to try to get some fresh eyes, 
And Parkinson was briefed on the case and its progress every two to three weeks. So he was kind of like determined to get this case solved. According to the Slow Tribune, on the 20th anniversary, quote, the Smart family issued a statement saying, she was a girl with dreams and visions for the future. We plan to find a way for them to live on. So they were kind of like, Aww. like, we know something bad happened, but at this point we have to focus on, like, the positive of her life and, you know, right. like, move on as much as we can. That must have been so hard. You know, I know to have no closure, but have to focus on like the good. I know. So in September of that year, we finally had some real movement in the case. On September 6, 2016, the slow sheriff announced that they would be excavating sites on a hillside on campus near the well-known Cal Poly P. And I've actually been to this hillside in 2019 and I hiked up to the P. Um, it's basically right behind a lot of the on-campus dorms, and it's a common like hiking trail for students. There's it's basically a hill. There's a P on the hillside, and then above it, there's kind of like a deck where you can like look over the city and the campus. So a lot of students would you know hike up there. My sister has done it a ton of times. The sheriff Parkinson announced that quote a new lead strongly suggests. Smart's remains may be buried on that hillside. And from the Slow Tribune articles that I read, it sounds like this all came from that new detective being assigned to the case and starting to look through all of the old files. So Parkinson coming in and making that decision really like did kickstart the case and like props to him for for doing that. The hillside um, actually was searched back in June of 1996, but they never dug anything up or anything. And this time they planned to dig at least three feet in areas where FBI human remains detection dogs alerted at several specific points. So they were like searching multiple areas of the hill and this time they were going to dig. That's good. So they didn't dig the first time. Right. They just like shift sifted through it. At the end of this search, they took away, quote, bones and a possible item of interest. But the bones are later revealed to be animal bones. So one year later, after this search, the sheriff's office, like, basically said that the search, search was beneficial, but they haven't said anything else about the dig since. Moving forward again to September of 2019, a podcast was actually created devoted to Kristen's disappearance. Um, it's called Your Own Backyard, and it is an amazing investigative podcast by Chris Lambert, and I highly recommend you all go listen to it um, if you want more details about this case, because he actually uncovered a lot while doing the podcast. So I'm going to wow. talk about some of it here, but it was it's really neat to listen to him like uncover it all and kind of bring some new leads into the case. So what Your Own Backyard led to basically alleges that Paul Flores killed Kristen and then called his dad to help him in the middle of the night and that his parents helped him cover it up poss and possibly even buried Kristen's remains and or belongings in the backyard of their house. My jaw just hit the floor. Wow. That's, I mean, I definitely, Paul was on my radar too, but like to, ha to, to have his parents like help. I mean, obviously we don't know that yet, but still that's like, right. No, mm -mm, that's not parenting. <laughs> that <is> not parenting. <laughs> no, it's not parenting. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's crazy. So I'm going to talk about some of like what he discovered here, what Chris Lambert, the, the person who did the podcast discovered, but there is more that he talks about. So again, I'd recommend listening to it and it will be linked in the show notes as well. First of all, Flores's mother, Susan, apparently went to into work the morning after the weekend that Kristen disappeared, complaining to a colleague at the time that she had slept poorly since her husband had gotten a call in the middle of the night and left the house in his car. So this led to speculation that he had gotten a call from his son, Paul, after he killed Kristen. It's yeah. never been said or proven, but that's what everybody speculates. Right. Wow. Wow. Um, another discovery that I'm going to quote from a CBS article, quote, 
In October 1996, Mary Lassiter was renting Paul Flores's mother's house in Arroyo Grande when she found a woman's earring in the driveway. So this is like how many months? May to October. It's the same year that Kristen went. Right. That Kristen disappeared like five months later. She says the jewelry appeared to match a ne- necklace that Kristen Smart was wearing in one of the missing posters. And the earring was actually turned over to the San Luis Obispo Sheriff's Office detective. But it was never marked as evidence. And basically it was lost. Of course it was. <laughs> and this is the last like discovery that came from the podcast about this case. Um, And although it's never led to anything or like been proven, this one is like (laughs) the craziest one. And it's like so fucking creepy to me. So just get ready. Okay. And this is also what kind of like blew up the podcast and brought like a lot of media attention and like to the podcast and to the case as a whole. So Chris Lambert really did an amazing thing with this podcast and Like, I think he's a big part in, like, why this case had a lot of movement. So shout out to him. From a RecordNet article, and I'm going to read this quote. It's a little bit long, but I didn't want to try to paraphrase it. Quote, a tenant who lived for a year at Susan Flores's home, and I, I, in some places, heard that it was the same tenant that found the earring, but in others it didn't say, so I'm not going to say if it was or not. Okay. Um, So this tenant told Chris Lambert, the podcast host, that she heard a watch alarm every morning at 4.20 a.m. Smart had worked as a lifeguard at 5 a.m. at the Cal Poly pool. So it's possible she set her watch to wake up at that early hour. Wow. So I don't know about you, but that sounds pretty damn compelling to me. That's some compelling evidence. Definitely worth exploring further, you know? Yep. Those watches like have the longest damn battery lives. And once you set an alarm, like it will like go off every morning. So that's just really sketchy that that was happening. Um, And it's not like they could find like the, this tenant couldn't like find it somewhere in the house or something like that. Like, I don't know. It's just very sketchy. And in my opinion, my opinion only, it could indicate that Kristen and or her belongings were buried in Susan Flores' backyard. I Yeah, I agree. And they should definitely explore that further because it's like we said on the last episode, it's better to like explore something and be wrong than to just be like, eh, there's no way. And then there could be like major breakthroughs in cases that you're just not willing to look further into, which is absurd. Yep. I agree with you. Um, And that kind of leads another really good segue from you (laughs) into what I was going to talk about next. Um, (laughs) It basically like a lot of people were like, why the hell was her backyard not looked at more? Um, And, You know, like, why didn't they just dig it up to prove if it was if something was there? Right. Um, So I'm going to explain the timeline of like what searching happened in that backyard. And this timeline comes from digupthyard.com. And they do go into more details on that website. So if you want to look through it, it will be linked in the show notes. But I'm going to kind of give like an outline of what happened over the whole time. Um, that Kristen was missing in that backyard. Okay. So in June 2000, the slow sheriff's office had a search warrant and actually ended up searching the backyard, but they didn't find anything. And it should be noted that they did not dig anything up. And my guess would be they like basically looked around to see if they could see anything sketchy and didn't see anything. So in May 2007, an unnamed FBI agent decided to, as a private citizen, contact Susan Flores. And she actually agreed to allow him to search a portion of her backyard without a warrant. So again, he was not acting as a police force or anything. He was an FBI agent, but in this case, he was doing this on his own time as a private citizen. So although nothing was found, this FBI agent still thinks that Kristen's body is in that backyard, just not where he was allowed to search. 
And I honestly think that that is so sketchy. Like, if you're not hiding anything, why limit the search to only one portion? Like, if somebody yeah. accused me of something and I wasn't guilty, I would do yeah. everything to prove I was innocent and, like, right. let them search everywhere they wanted. And Susan Flores didn't do that. He basically made this FBI agent. She she basically <laughs> made this FBI agent only search in one portion of the backyard. So, of course, he didn't find anything because she probably let him search where nothing she was knew. hidden. Exactly. And also, just a little interesting side note. It has been reported in the early 2000s that concrete was poured in the Flores yard the same weekend Kristen vanished. Oh, well, that's definitely suspicious. (laughs) Yeah. In June 2015, um, this is the next step of what happened in the backyard. A retired detective, Paul Dosti, took his cadaver dog, Buster, to search the perimeter of the Flores property. Now, I'm pretty sure they only searched around the property and, like, couldn't actually go into it. And I can't remember where I heard this, but I think that they basically, like, were able to go into a neighbor's yard and go up to the fence of the Flores property. Um, But they didn't actually, like, go in the yard. And according to that Dig Up the Yard article, quote, Buster alerted to the presence of human decomposition four separate times on the Flores property. And, you know, as we've kind of said, there's always questions about cadaver dogs like this, but Buster is actually super well known and very credible. Um, According to a Daily Mail article I found, he is, quote, the mystery solving three legged dog who has helped track down the remains of 200 people, including lost soldiers and murder victims. Wow. Um, So he apparently helped find a World War II pilot whose plane had crashed in Belgium in 1944. So all I'm saying, like, is as far as dogs go, he is pretty damn credible. Oh, my gosh. And he's old. He would have to be so old by then, wouldn't he? I think that it was, like, the plane crashed in 1944, but they, like, searched later. Yeah. Yeah. I had the same thought. (laughs) But, yeah. I was like, oh, he's a miracle dog. (laughs) Might not be a miracle dog living forever, but he is pretty damn credible. So yeah, that happened. That alert happened. um, But the slow sheriff's department never did anything about it. So like, despite Dosti's attempts to get them to take like a soil sample from the backyard, they never did anything about it. So bizarre. So that's all that happened. In the Flores backyard, the sheriff's department has not ever gone back um, and dug anything up or used any of the technology that's like available today to determine if there are human remains underground. So all of these discoveries and allegations came out from Lambert's podcast and the case was gaining momentum. Then in January of 2020, some huge news hit when Denise Smart was apparently told by the FBI that a new development in the case was imminent and to, quote, be ready. So this got a lot of attention. And it was actually when I, this was like when I started looking into the case more and I found the Your Own Backyard podcast and like listened to it and was all in. Now, this actually didn't lead to anything big as far as like anything that the media could get their hands on. Um, We didn't hear any big news from the investigators and the smarts did share that they were disappointed. Mm. 11 days later on January 29th, 2020, the sheriff's office announced, quote, since 2011, it has served 18 search warrants, conducted physical evidence searches at nine locations, submitted 37 evidence items from the early days of the case for modern DNA testing recovered 140 new items of evidence, including two trucks that belonged to members of the Flores family in 1996. In addition, the agency says it has conducted 91 in-person interviews, written 364 supplemental reports related to the case, and spent approximately $62,000 in investigation expenses during this time. So like, that's all fine and dandy, but don't come and say, expect something big and then not share anything big. Get the family's hopes up. That's why would they do that after so many years of nothing, you know? Right. And according to like some of the articles that I read, the FBI basically said like, we never said that and whatever, but like, I don't know. Yeah. But either way, 
On February 5th, 2020, four search warrants were served for specific items of evidence in four separate locations. Susan and Ruben Flores's homes, they lived in separate homes. I'm assuming they were like not together. Um, so these were both in Arroyo Grande, California, near Slow. Paul Flores's home in San Pedro, California, and at his sister's home in Washington State. So we basically don't know a lot about these warrants since they were sealed by the court. Um, but just over one year later, on February 11th, 2021, Paul Flores was arrested in Los Angeles on suspicion of being a felon in possession of a firearm, which actually came from information obtained the previous year in the searches. On March 15th, 2021, the sheriff's office got a warrant to search Ruben Flores' home in Arroyo Grande, bringing cadaver dogs and ground-penetrating radar. The search took two days, but because this is an ongoing investigation, nothing was shared about what was found. But finally, on April 13th, 2021, almost 25 years since Kristen Smart disappeared, Paul and Ruben Flores were taken into custody. (laughs) At a news conference that same afternoon, surrounded by photos of Kristen, the timeline of her case, and photos of the Flores men being arrested, the slow sheriff Parkinson spoke. He announced that Paul Flores had been arrested for the murder of Kristen Smart, and Ruben Flores had been arrested as an accessory to the murder. He explained the timeline of the investigation of this case, and he even mentioned the Your Own Backyard podcast and how that helped bring some more information to light. The um, investigators had actually gotten a court court order to monitor pa- Paul Flores' text messages and phone calls, and he said that the searches in 2020 led to discovery of evidence related to the murder of Kristen Smart, both in Paul and Ruben Flores' homes. So this is what led to those arrest warrants. I wonder what they found. (laughs) Yeah. And they basically, we're going to find out a little bit, but because it's like literally going to trial soon, like they couldn't share much. So Parkinson announced that Paul was charged with murder and had, you know, no bail. He wasn't getting out. And that Ruben was charged with accessory to murder with a $250,000 bail. Um, And unfortunately, they weren't able to share any details about what was found since the warrants were sealed and that it was a case that would go to trial. But he did say that physical evidence was found in at least two homes. He also said that they had not discovered Kristen's remains. Mm -hmm. And he basically vowed to to continue searching until they did. Well, hopefully Paul does the right thing and just confesses and gives up where her body is. And what about the right. mother? Like they, she didn't, she didn't get arrested for being a, an accessory. She or... didn't at this time. Yeah. Okay. No. Nope. Interesting. Interesting. So Paul Flores's attorney actually put a motion for a gag order, which would basically prevent any parties from publicly commenting on the case outside of the courtroom, and it was granted by a judge. Hmm. On April nineteenth, both men pled not guilty to their charges. Um, thankfully the judge denied Paul's bail, but did lower Ruben's bail to $50,000 and he was released on April 21st. It also came out that aside from being accused of murdering Chris, Kristen Smart, Paul Flores had a criminal history, including two ongoing sexual assault investigations and being linked by DNA to an alleged 2007 rape in Redondo beach. He had not been charged for any of that. So again, he was like getting away with stuff. Um, but according to the slow tribune article, quote, a county probation hearing submitted to the court in opposition to bail for either defendant obtained by the tribune reveals for the first time that prosecutors say dozens of women have recounted Paul Flores's sexual assaults and predatory behavior that document his 25 years as a serial rapist. So like, thank God he didn't get bail. Finally, he's being held accountable for something. That's so crazy how he slipped through the cracks so many times. Yep. It's like the indication of a creep. Yeah. I wonder if his family has like a lot of money and that's how he was able to like get away with Yeah, maybe. X, Y, and Z, you know? Yeah. Very possible. Wow. So on May 17th, 2021, 
The two men appeared in court in front of Judge Craig Van Royen. (laughs) Don't think I'm saying that right, but go go on with it. Um, A 12-day preliminary hearing was set to begin on July 6th, and that was uh, later delayed after the prosecution had yet to provide all discovery for the case. Um, The preliminary hearing was finally set for July 20th, and the first in-person courtroom hearing in the case happened on July 14th. According to the Tribune, quote, Susan Flores was seated in the audience behind Paul. Susan Flores appeared in order to oppose a subpoena to testify in the preliminary hearing. Um, And then they once again, like pushed off the preliminary hearing to August 2nd, which as far as I'm aware, as of now, it's still set to begin August 2nd. Deputy District Attorney Chris who, oh gosh, this is even a harder name. <laughs> Puvrel, Puvrel, I think. Um, <laughs> he shared, quote, for the first time in court that rape and rape pornography was found at Flores' San Pedro home, including homemade videos allegedly showing Flores raping incapacitated women, and that they, quote, found two date rape drugs that could be used to render women unable to consent to sex. Um, according to the Tribune, dozens of women are basically willing to attest to, quote, Flores' longstanding sexually predatory behavior. Which makes me wonder how everyone, not everyone, but certain reports from the night that she went missing said that she was completely incapacitated. But people also said that they didn't even see her drink that much. So maybe this motherfucker was doing that shit way back True. then. True. Setting her up for the night. And maybe it got a little bit too out of hand and he ended up killing her. Wow. True. And I didn't even think about it like that. But they basically like at this point as the trial goes on, they've like come to the like almost conclusion that they basically think that he it was an t- attempted race rape went wrong and then he killed her yep that's what it sounds like to me can't wait for this motherfucker to get sentenced and convicted so at this point the prosecution actually tried to bring the los angeles rape allegations like into this case but that was denied um the judge denied including that in this case which like i get it because it's not involved technically it's evidence. Like it's not pertaining yeah. to the case, but it is definitely evidence. It's like evidence. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I hate that. So Paul Flores's attorney, Robert Sanger, entered a motion to close the proceedings to the public, and the judge also denied that. But with this, the judge also unsealed more than 80 pages related to the motion. And this finally revealed to the public more details on what was found in the searches and investigations. So as I mentioned, they found those like videos on Flores's computer of him raping women um, and also reported that 29 women accuse him of a variety of sexual misconduct incidents. 29 29 women? Oh my God. Yeah. Um, The other two things that they found (laughs) make me so happy in the sense that like this is moving towards like proving that he did this and that we are like that much closer to getting this son of a bitch with these two things that they revealed. Um, So according to the Slow Tribune article, quote, traces of human blood and fibers, possibly from clothing, was found in samples taken from a roughly four by six patch of disturbed soil under the back deck at Ruben Flores's white court property. I think that's the uh, street address. An archaeologist said it was likely that a body had been buried at the location, removed, and the hole refilled. So basically, a spot under the deck, like, was, you know, uh, looked at with ground-penetrating radar, and that showed that there was an anomaly and soil disturbance, indicating that the soil was dug up and put back. And then this same soil... They took a sample of it and human blood was detected in both the March 15th and 16th dig and the April 12th search. The fibers found were also consistent in color with Kristen's clothing from the night she went missing. So I assume he still resides at the house that they were originally. Mm -hmm. Okay. Wow. I think so. This document also revealed, quote, in January 
um, as the criminal investigation intensified, Susan Flores was heard on a wiretap telling Paul Flores on the phone, the other thing I need you to do is start listening to the podcast. I need you to listen to everything they say so we can punch holes in it. Um, wherever we, we can punch holes. Maybe we can't. You, you're the only one that can tell me. Paul didn't respond to the statement. And um, bitch, you're getting arrested because you're an accessory. Like that, she knows. Right? If she didn't help, she still yeah. knows and she deserves to go to jail too. Susan. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> that like, that sounds pretty damn guilty to me. I mean, yes. like, of course she could be saying it so that they don't get charged for something they didn't do. But along with everything no. else, it seems pretty damn guilty. Yeah. I mean, they found blood and fibers. I mean, they haven't confirmed that it is, you know, linked directly to that crime. But what else would it yeah. be? You know, it's like. Along with everything else and him being the last person to see her. Like. Exactly. There's it's no too... denying that he was the last person with her. It, yeah. Yeah. And he already had that, you know, creeper, peep Tom stuff going on. And it, like, right. like you said, it just got, it went a little too far and got a little too out of hand. So that's basically where we're at now. The most recent news was about the judge blocking the prosecutor's attempt to add the rape charges. And the preliminary hearing is still set to happen on August 2nd. So I will definitely be doing an update on this case. I'll probably wait until the trial is done and like maybe even cover the entire entire trial especially if they do decide to plead innocent, like yeah. that could be a really interesting trial. Who knows? Honestly, usually that these kind of things end up like with a plea deal or something like that, but I yep. don't care. I just want him to go to jail. Um, but I will definitely do a follow-up once the trial is done. I thought about like waiting to do this case until like the trial was done, but I wanted to get the story out there. Um, especially since the trial is literally going to happen like next week. So, yeah, no, I'm glad you did it now because it'll be interesting to like now follow along with the trial and then have like an updated right episode to like let everyone, I mean, I'm sure people are going to be wanting to follow along and, and find out what happens regardless, but the ones who don't, oh, they can have another episode. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So that is the case of the disappearance and alleged murder of Kristen Smart. And I only say alleged because technically at the time of this recording, it has not been proven. Her remains have not been found. But Paul Flores has been arrested and charged with her murder. Um, if you would like to help or donate in remembrance of Kristen, the Smart family has a website, kristensmart.org. And Kristen is spelled K-R-I-S-T-I-N. Um, and they actually on this site have a place where people can donate to a scholarship fund. Um, and this fund is for women seeking degrees in law enforcement, forensic science, or architecture, which was what Kristen was studying. Um, the scholarship mm -hmm. is called the Justice for Kristen Smart Scholarship. So that's definitely where my next donation is going to be going um, because, you know, it's something in her to remember her by. And, you know, again, they're trying to make as much good out of this as they can. So I hope that the smart family gets the justice that they deserve. And I hope that Me too. Paul Flores gets, you know, put he in deserves. <laughs> prison for the rest of his life. Yeah. Yeah. So that is the case of Kristen smart. Wow. That was really good. And wow. Yeah. That's, I'm just like mine. Actually I'm not because this, we've heard this time and time again where people drop the ball and, all that, but I'm just glad that like something is actually, even though it's, you know, what, thir almost 30 years later, right? 30? I'm doing Yeah, that. 25. Yeah. 25 years later. Yeah. Wow. I know. And like, seriously, major shout out to Chris Lambert for doing that podcast. I think like basically he had like seen billboards. He was from the area and he had seen billboards for her and like started looking into it and then like really started looking into it. And he interviewed people that had never been interviewed and he found things wow. that like the only place I was able to find them were from his podcast or articles about his podcast. Yeah. Um, so he definitely, I mean, it's like the guy that did um, Up and Vanished. I know. He That's what I was thinking did of. did a podcast that led to the confession. So yeah, it's, this guy is awesome. And maybe one day we'll be able to um, make that kind of impact, but. I'm like, definitely going to listen to his podcast. Yeah. Yeah. I love I'm going like to listen that. again. I had listened to it back in like 
back when that news came out in like January of 2020. And I was going to listen to it again before this, but I didn't want to like listen and then accidentally like say something that, you know, wasn't like fair. You know, I didn't want to make it like too similar or anything, but I'm going to go back and listen again. um, Because I just remember it being like so crazy. The watch thing is just like, yeah, ridiculous. I know. Like, like she, how would she know that, that she had to be at work at 5 a.m. because she's, was a, a lifeguard lifeguard like, yeah yeah so yeah how would she know that she wouldn't know that but that's very compelling no. that's a very like in your face evidence I mean it's circumstantial exactly. but ah. but still yeah <laughs> with everything else mm-hmm. yeah so that is the case and I'm glad I got to tell it and I'm excited to do an update um as soon as that's all done we will do an update it'll probably be a couple months especially because like the preliminary hearing literally keeps getting delayed they're not even like at the actual trial yet yeah um part of me hopes that he just like pleads guilty and like it can be done but the like true crime research lover in me hopes yeah. that there's like an actual trial but for the sake of the smarts you know whatever is quickest and as long as they get justice yeah yep yep and I hope that they find her body. I know. Me too. I, I think it's in that back. I mean, it's in that backyard. Or at least it was at one point. Yeah. Sounds like it they very might have well moved could have it. been moved. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you guys for listening. I hope you enjoyed listening. Um, we'll post photos uh, related to this case on our Instagram at inhuman underscore podcast. Um, so be sure to go check it out. See the beautiful Kristen Smart. Um, you can also follow us on Twitter. Um, I know nothing about Twitter, but I am <laughs> <laughs> trying. Um, so follow us over on Twitter at Inhuman underscore podcast. Um, and on TikTok at Inhuman Podcast. Yeah. Follow us on all the things. And um, if you guys enjoy this podcast, be sure to subscribe. And if you enjoy listening, we would love if you could leave a rating and or review. It really helps push us out, um, especially on iTunes. If you can leave that review, it helps push us out to other people. um, And we'd love to reach as many people as possible. Share these stories. Yeah. And if you don't want to write a full review, all you have to do is just hit that little five star and give us a little five star review (laughs) if you like the podcast exactly all right you guys thank you for listening we'll see you in the next one Bye. bye